That's my three favorite things in the world. A hammer, a ruler, and a crowbar. Yeah. Hey, Mitch. Uh, so I came back here last night and took a look at this, mm -hmm. and I realized how little, I guess, I really understood about what's going on with that piece right there. Uh, you said underneath the floor is going to be this. Did you say it may be asbestos? That is asbestos. It that's is. in the adhesive. That's the adhesive. And it has oh. A, they tested it too. It does have asbestos wow. in it also. So the tile has it and the adhesive. Yes. Wow. What a mess. Yes. And any clue how deep this goes yet? No, I mean, it's just a, a skim coat. But okay. still, it's, it's probably adhered really well. So. Right. Because you see the tile turn loose from that, not that from the concrete. Right. So. Now, this stuff has to be ex like taken out anyway, right? It's not like we should just build over it. Like, no, the only bit we're taking up is back there where you want to expose the concrete. Everything else, we'll put carpet back over it. or If you cover it back over, it's fine. What if, would it be more cost effective to put some type of like wood anything like that may look like wood paneling or that is actually some sort of just wood paneling on the floor? Uh, yeah. I mean, we could put a, uh, uh, a laminate floor. You know, it doesn't even, I mean, we could put a glue down, a glue down wood floor. How much may something like the process picking up the tiles for these two rooms cost? I haven't heard yet. You the guy's supposed to work me up a quote. What could you? Would you even ballpark it? Or are you I have no earthly idea. All right, fair enough. I would, I would say it's probably going to be several thousand dollars. Right. But I think Joseph was anticipating that. Right. Now let me see here. Once but these are exposed, is the concrete polished like over there, or is it ragged and jagged? That's what I'm saying. I don't know how well that will come off to look like this. Right. See, that's raw. That has nothing on it. Right. I, and even the guy that came out and looked, he said, I can't guarantee you how clean we can get it. Okay. Um, I mean, it may still have stains all in it. Right, which is sort of gross. Yeah. Um, how much would literally some sort of, what are our options if, like, I know wood is, like, this polish, the polished cement's very reflective, and we would use that in our own way to our advantage. How much, would it cost possibly less to actually put in wood on what, the floor? What would a wood floor do to the acoustics in the room? Well, they're... Compared to carpet or... The thing is the carpet tile. does like soak in... Um, Which is bad? Sound. Well, it's not always bad. Uh, but in this particular instance, it's not what would be good for our purposes. It won't reflect it back, it'll absorb it. Mostly. It'll absorb it, and we'd like to have a little more control over the live liveliness of the room if we want. This would probably make it sound like a concert, I mean a big room. Maybe, maybe. it would be too much, I don't know. It sort of feels unnatural right now, like thinking about it. But that being said, like I know wood usually has a nice effect on, has a on the sound. To it. Yeah, it has a resonance to it. Well, that so, might be a viable option. Okay, because it'll still look nice. Um, yeah. It won't look nearly as. Uh, it still look it, You know, they make modern. They make a, a glue down strip flooring that's about three eighths of an inch thick. It's plywood with a veneer on it. You know, okay. but it looks like hardwood, and and I mean, it can glue down. Of course, the uh, the. Uh, The laminate flooring, like Pergo, you may have heard of Pergo. Right. It just snap locks together right. and it just floats. Th that's not even real wood, though, right? No. Yeah. It's yeah. it's actually formica, maybe with a wood grain finish right. to it. Right. But the inside of it is uh, kind of like masonite. Kind of, well, like kind of like pegboard. Right. So, you know, the, the flooring itself is somewhat like the pegboard, but the face of it is, is right. like Formica. And it will scratch. All right, now, which one is Formica? What's Formica? The countertop. Oh, the countertop. So, okay, okay. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't make me sit easy at all. But it looks like wood. Right. But 
But All things me, considered, I'm concerned about the look, but I'm also concerned about the sound, obviously. Both are. But I'll be honest, it looks like fake wood. It doesn't look like real wood. Right. To me, you know. Right. Honestly, I think that would bring down the class of the entire operation. Now, a now the bit. other floor, the glue down floor I'm talking about, it's right. tongue and groove, and it is, it has a wood veneer. Right. Know, the intermediate is like right. plywood, but it has a wood veneer. I think we may actually end up doing something like that because. I would talk to Joseph seriously about it. Yeah, because this seems like a big process to get to maybe more problems, and uh, the all of a sudden the feel of loss of control of what may be going on is usually a bad sign. But um, does not does bare concrete not reflect sound? It does very much so. But when it looks really cool, and also we're going to be using carpets across the floor on like like actual rugs in certain spots because we want to like be able a, like to customize it. Yeah, like different area rooms. If you can move that around and move we your sound We can move it room. all around. Yeah, the whole spot's going to be customizable. But what, the reason I asked that though, would the concrete not be pretty much the same as this? If you just put tile back down? See, I can't make that call because I know concrete, uh, even though I don't know about polished concrete, but I know like concrete blocks, there's actually the wonderful thing about them is that they're crazy dense, but they also have all these little air pockets that don't just bounce the sound up, they absorb it a little bit too, and it has like, as the sound moves through it, it dies out like naturally. Uh, actually, the, our main monitor speakers that we're going to be mixing with, mm -hmm. uh, there's a project to build a box to put them in that we're going to like put them on top of a steel pole. But uh, we're using concrete for a specific reason. And again, I don't know if the polished has those same properties, but uh, at this point, it seems like it may be safer and smarter to go with like that snap wood floor or something like that, because we're going to be covering it up anyway, but we still want to be able to like move the carpets around and still have it look nice. So um, it'll definitely look nice. All right. Is it crazy expensive? Not terribly expensive, no. Because I want to do it in both rooms. I mean, uh, it's, it's cheaper than full three-quarter inch. I mean, I think they make a full three-quarter inch glue down. Right. You know, hardwood like... I think we put some hardwood in your mom's kitchen, didn't we? Yes, yes. And then there's another option is parquet. That's glue down hardwood. You know, the herringbone design, you've seen that. Oh, you know what? Now that you're mentioning all this, I think it'd be good to check oh, the, the it out. The parquet is like little squares that right. alternate. I know you've probably seen them. They're like yes, six, six absolutely. Inch. I mean, there's all kinds of flooring treatments that could be right. used. Um, I definitely... One thing I was looking forward to was having the gray of the concrete because I think the gray would is going to tie the steel, the joists, and the walls. I thought it was going to tie it together. Um, they probably have a gray colored hardware too. Really? Okay. We may. A gray this is style. sounding like our best bet because this sounds like the wrong type of too much work to have the people come lift it up, then possibly have stains everywhere and not have it look nice, and that's. I mean, it's good to be able to listen to my gut because my gut's like, eh, <laughs> eh, bad idea. We found out enough and can't we can't go this route anymore. Even if we, we even if we, the expense of taking it up probably isn't. Well, he he told me the other day. He said, well, and this is probably a a way of saying I'm gonna I, I make me a lick right off the bat. Said I know it's going to require one mobilization. You know. And I'm uh, going, Get out here and bullshit. You know, <laughs> right. You know. Right. Because it sounds expensive, right? Yeah. But I guess the problem is, though, if you do take the tile up, you then expose the adhesive. So then right. you're probably, you probably have to do something with that. Right. You can't just leave it and glue right. it. I don't know if you could just turn around and glue right back over that and be right. where the EPA would have except that right. you may have to take that up once you expose it. I don't know. Okay. Joseph would know. Joseph would know. Wow. Well, I'm really glad uh, there, we there, talked about this. It's a big, big, it's very important. People have been trying to get me to get certified as a, uh, to, to remove lead and, well, you know, older houses that have lead paint. Right. 
you have to be certified now if you're going in there and you're starting to scrape and grind, you know, you have to do go through a process and right. people are trying to get me to, to do to do that. It's about seven hundred and fifty dollars to get certified. Right. You have to take a course and then they give you a completion the diploma or certificate. Then you have to send that to the EPA. Wow. And then that's like three hundred and fifty dollars they said for each, so it's about seven hundred, seven hundred and fifty dollars. And it's only good for five years, I think, maybe three years. Mm. Then you have to be recertified again. So in case there's revolutionary steps in <coughs> asbestos removal. Gotcha. That's just wow. for lead. That's not for asbestos. Oh, oh, for lead. Just for lead. You know, lead paint. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm glad we figured that out. Um, it's a little rainy today. I, I think Joe was going to be uh, pleased to hear that you're willing to go that route yeah, instead of this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll figure it out. And it feels good uh, to well, not I, do this I anymore. should hear from that guy in a, in a couple of days, so that we'll have a, a comparison. We'll know what it's going to cost to do that. Okay, great. That's really great. So we'll have a comparison uh, to, do a removal. to do the removal of everything we've been talking about, this tile. And then I don't even think it's going to even include that adhesive. But knowing what that's going to cost, um, we can then see what type of wood options we have. Oh, I want to say this as well. Uh, when we were talking about the different, or when uh, Mitch was talking about the different types of wood we may be able to put on the ground. Uh, you know, we're not sparing, uh, like, expense as far as, uh, you know, we know what we want as far as functionability, and we're going to do the best uh, that we can to make sure that's all done and installed the right way, best materials we can for the job. But um, he was mentioning different types of wood that normally may not sound too attractive uh, and uh, as far as, like, putting it down. It would have seemed anything less than, you know, really fancy wood floor, why would you want that in your studio? Uh, well, a lot of things with floors in studios is that it's to stop sound and vibrations. Uh, one, vibrations coming in and messing with your mic, you know, it could resonate through a mic stand and to your mic, uh, it'll actually make noise that your recording can pick up. Um, so, vibrations in the ground, bad news. That's why a lot of people spend a lot of time putting like a uh, a whole entire like framework across the floor and then putting another uh, like floor on top of like a framework so it's raised um, stop vibrations but also to cut down on sound because most of the things that people do um, a lot of the standards that people abide by when building a studio it's because they don't have an ideal environment believe it or not uh, some of the world's I mean uh, Eternally, most uh, famous engineers say that the most ideal listening space is in a big open field uh, with just your speakers pointing because there's nothing that's going to be reflecting, but you can't do that because there's all this extra noise, there's neighbors, you know, it's, it's real world stuff that keeps, that has made the standards uh, that we build our studios with. But the thing is, we don't have any vibrations on this floor. This is like solid concrete underneath. Um, it's not a big fly zone area here at all. And also, 18-wheelers generally do not come down this street. Uh, we've done tests to see if uh, we can feel vibrations or if meters uh, uh, recognize any vibrations in the floor or read any vibra vibrations in the floor. And also, since we don't have anybody above us, we don't have anybody below us, we don't have to worry about the crazy soundproofing that we're going to be doing with, like, our walls, um, because we don't have to worry about neighbors. So, I just felt like I wanted to explain that, and uh, so that's why, you know, the less than most amazing wood, uh, or, like, the thickest type of wood, or would be acceptable, because we want a certain type of reflectivity coming from the floor that we're going to be able to control with different throw rubs and the entire rest of the customizable features slash system we're installing in the studio and the control room.